Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Strange Pathways. I am your host, Scott Mort. Um, kind of doing this one out of order this week. The show is all recorded and, uh, and this is actually the last thing I'm recording. It was a little bit of a frustrating record today. I, I had fun with all the stories and what have you, but I have a cough that, man, I am just having a rough time getting rid of. So I've had to pause and edit and, uh, yeah, it's, it's been a rough one. But it's always, always a blast visiting with you every week. On to this week's tales. When I was a child, very few entertainers really made me laugh as hard as Charlie Chaplin. I grew up with some greats, Abbott and Costello, Laurel and Hardy, the Three Stooges, just some absolute wonderful, wonderful comics of old. And chief among them was Chaplin, his little tramp just every time. It never got old. Now, Charlie Chaplin, you may not know, was a London native. Chaplin had faced a challenging upbringing in poverty. And he found his initial breakthrough in the entertainment industry with a minor role in a British production of Sherlock Holmes. During his teenage years, Chaplin traveled across the countryside with a theater troupe, often seeking affordable accommodations in each town they visited. In his autobiography, Chaplin recounted an unusual experience during his stay in the Welsh town of Ebu Vale. He characterized this town as dank and ugly. In his account, Chaplin's host, a coal miner, led him into the kitchen after dinner to witness a peculiar spectacle. From the kitchen cupboard, a man with no legs emerged, Apparently, he was using it as a sleeping space. At the miner's encouragement, the legless man performed a series of unconventional tricks and dances. Chaplin vividly described them as follows. A half man with no legs, an oversized blonde flat-shaped head, a sickening white face, a sunken nose, a large mouth, and powerful, muscular shoulders and arms crawled from underneath the dresser. A Gilbert, jump, said the father, and the wretched man lowered himself slowly, then shot up by his arms almost to the height of my head. How do you think he'd fit in with a circus, the human frog? I was so horrified I could hardly answer. However, I suggested the names of several circuses that he might write to. This unsettling incident traumatized Chaplin. Years later, inspired by Chaplin's tale, the X-Files writer Glenn Morgan co-wrote the episode Home with James Wong. Morgan revisited Chaplin's story, although he slightly misremembered details, such as the man being completely legless. Nonetheless, the vivid image stuck with Morgan, influencing the creation of the character Mama Peacock in one of the X-Files' most controversial episodes. As for Gilbert, the legless man under the dresser, little information is available about his identity, his burial place, any birth records that may have existed. He seems to have disappeared into history, and I have a sad sad suspicion that his life was both short and sad. (laughs) 
Reddit user Tinfoil Tales worked night shift. A co-worker and Tinfoil Tales were both driving down a country road after work. Tinfoil Tales estimates it was around 4.45 a.m. Outside, it was still dark. Suddenly, the co-worker's taillights get brighter. He was hitting the brakes. And then the co-worker swerves down into the ditch, comes back out onto the road, and keeps going. Now this, for sure, grabs Tinfoil Tail's attention. Tinfoil Tail's approaches that same area and sees a really, really immense, tall black figure walking in the road. This black entity has a weird, unnatural gait, almost like it's being blown by the wind, but it wasn't. Tinfoil Tail's mind is trying to wrap around what exactly he's seeing. And at first, they think it's a really tall person wrapped up in a big black blanket. You see, Tinfoil Tails didn't see any arms or a head, just two big legs and a torso. They have to swerve to avoid it as well. They come to a full stop and the thing walks past their driver's window. It's estimated that this monstrosity was around seven foot tall. It was leaning forward and was still a foot or so taller than the top of Tinfoil Tail's vehicle. It gets behind the car. Tinfoil Tails can see the taillights lighting up this creature's legs, but he can't make out any details like hair or anything like clothing. Just large, thick, black legs. They take off down the road once it was behind them. Tinfoil Tails notices that their co-worker has pulled into a gravel parking lot. So they pull in beside him. The co-worker is freaking out. Did you see it? Did you see it? It didn't have a head. It, It was huge. It did not have a head. Tinfoil Tails is pretty brave. They say, we need to go back. We need to see what this thing is. It was so oblivious to us driving at it. It didn't know we were there. The co-worker doesn't want to, but Tinfoil Tails is able to talk him into it. And he ends up following right behind. They drive back the way they came. And around the same area... There's a large black dog laying across the road. Not a normal sized dog. Much, much larger. But it looked dead. Now this had only been three or so minutes since that first encounter. This was new. Tinfoil Tails decides, I'm going to go out. I'm going to go see if, if, if this dog's alive or not. If it's dead, he intends to move it off to the side of the road because you really couldn't drive around this without going off the edge of the road on either side. It's so big. They get about 15 feet away and the dog raises its head up and looks back at them, and its eyes are glowing yellow. Tinfoil Tails writes it off as just eye shine. The dog lets out a low, deep, rumbling, guttural sound, and he freezes. The dog thing tries to stand up. Seems like it has some sort of problem with its front legs, but it stands up, And it continues to stand up on two legs. It stands up on its back legs for just a second or two. Enough time to stare at both of them. 
but then it gets back down on all fours and runs off to the wooded area. There's a really tall fence, so they can't figure out how it manages to disappear. It would either have to go over, under, or through the fence, but this thing just vanished. After all this, there was one last strange thing. The co-worker has been in his car the entire time. This co-worker gets out of his car after the dog thing leaves. He comes up to tinfoil tails. He goes, what in the world was that? They're talking about what they've just seen. They look down and they see a mouse standing between them on its hind legs, just sitting there washing its face. Tinfoil Tails nudges it with his shoe. It doesn't even care. Completely oblivious to their existence. Even after being nudged, it just keeps cleaning itself. Almost like it was the small version of the tall, headless entity. They're done. They leave. The co-worker goes home. Tinfoil Tails goes to his home. And they wake up later in the day and they start looking into werewolves. And they come across Dogman stories. Now... This didn't have the hands or feet like a dog man does. It had normal dog paws. It was just sort of a black wolf style look about it. Just big and really fluffy fur. It didn't seem to match with normal wolf type fur. Now, it wasn't a bear. It didn't have mange. It just looks like a big black dog. Tinfoil Tails finds out about the Fresno Nightcrawler. But these are usually white. The Nightcrawlers are usually white in appearance, not nearly as thick and tall. It's it's so otherworldly the way that it moved. Tinfoil Tails says he always thinks of those inflatable tube men that flap around the wind when they try to describe the movements. The mouse, that was really odd because they physically touched it. They know it was real, just didn't care. They never saw anything like that again. Tinfoil only lives about four miles from where it happened, and they drive through there often. And... Tinfoil has been pretty skeptical most of his life. He's been trying to explain it away. Maybe the dog was playing with the mouse. Maybe, maybe the dog was hit by a car. And the mouse was traumatized from the dog messing with it. And, but nothing is making any sense. It's just another one of those high strangeness cases that doesn't have a good ending that doesn't have a bad ending it just sort of ends it's an event it's there it has no meaning it's it's absurd in a way the Native Americans speak of the trickster an entity that just enjoys confusing its victims. And I have to say, this seems very, very in line with trickster behavior.
Did you really think we'd make it through an entire episode without going to my favorite website in the whole world? Phantomsandmonsters.com cannot sing the praises of this website enough. Our witness, SM, is a Kansas woman. But at this point, it's the Christmas holiday. She's in southeastern Ohio to visit family. On Christmas Day, SM and her family go out to a piece of property they own. Now, there's a shooting range on this property, and it's a beautiful, peaceful day. She walks with her grandchildren, takes pictures in the woods. They, these woods, they're remote, they're deep. It's so, so peaceful and wonderful. SM and the grandkids return back to the lodge where, where they were staying that Monday, everything was fine. The next day, though, SM set her pajamas out on a stand so they would be out that night. They were planning on getting ready on leaving early Wednesday morning. SM's family comes to the lodge, has dinner, plays a board game, what have you, just good family fun. Later that night, whenever S.M. went to bed, she reached for her pajamas, and they were soaking wet. No explanation, just sitting there, dripping wet. They drive all day. They get home. They start unpacking the bags. They go to one of the duffel bags with the Christmas gifts in it, SM had received a kitchen towel with a snowman on it. They, they get the towel, and it, too, was dripping wet. Nothing else, though, in the bag is wet. Even though the towel had been laying on things like cardboard, stuff that should have soaked up water from it. But that towel is wet and nothing else. And whenever SM had packed that bag, that towel was not wet. SM brushes it off, and she decides to go downstairs into her sewing room to catch up on emails and bills and what have you. SM has this system. Rubber-backed 3x3 three three carpet squares over the concrete that has been waterproofed. And SM did that herself two years ago. She kicks off her slippers, walks across the room barefoot, and in the center of the room, the nine center carpet tiles were sopping wet. She checks all on the walls, every carpet tile lining, everything. The walls are dry. The carpet and the backing where the wall joins the floor, dry. They've even been in a drought. The ground is not saturated. There are no pipes that could have leaked. The dropped ceiling tiles would show water damage. Boy, I know that for a fact. I have a lot of that in my house. But these dropped ceiling tiles, perfectly fine. No dampness, no damage. Three water mysteries that SM cannot figure out. She's beginning to wonder, did she anger a water spirit out in the woods. Did it come home with her? I will say this. It does seem that water plays a big role in the paranormal. Like just sitting here, I can think, think of three instances. Uh, the, the rain man here in Pennsylvania. The, the water man. Uh, a piece of urban folklore stemming out of the Great Depression. Uh, the Flying Dutchman, made famous from the Pirates of the Caribbean movies. But in reality, it's, it's, it's a ghost ship that's seen somewhat regularly. Water and the paranormal go hand in hand. And I can understand why. I can't think of anything aside from air that is more important to the survival of humankind. I mean, it's, it's the big one. It's survivalists will tell you three minutes without air, three days without water. 
it's it's a pretty big deal. So I can definitely see why the paranormal would be attached to it. Thank you for joining us this week here on Strange Pathways. If you are having mental health trouble dealing with a paranormal incident, please reach out to the Opus Network at www.opusnetwork.org. Our Twitter is Pathway Strange, Instagram, Strange Pathways Podcast. Join us over on Facebook and email us, strangepathwaysmail at gmail.com. Thank you once again for joining us here this week. Take care of yourselves and each other.